recording. Move this out of the way. Okay. So let me minimize that. Okay. So if you've got any questions, just chime in, no problem. Um, we're gonna talk about collage historically as a technique, um, and then we're, how we're gonna weave that in um, as, a, as our assignment relating to color um, towards the end. So pay close attention to the various techniques that I talk about. If you've got a question about how something was done, ask, because it may actually pertain um, to the application of this assignment, because this assignment is gonna be fairly open. So. Make sure you're paying special note to um, how people are doing things. So as we talk about collage, um, the first question you might have is why? Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily um, about the waver of the hand or the imperfection of the hand, um, but it's, it's a new form of art, relatively speaking. Um, it's about 100 years old. And the first people to actually do collage were actually Pablo Picasso and a guy named George Brock. And George Brock was one of the early Cubists. And they actually coined the term collage. It means, uh, from French, colère, uh, to glue or to stick. It doesn't actually refer to paper, but has since adopt, adapted in, in terms of meaning as, as meaning um, dealing with paper. So originally, it generally described any works that would have been using anything pasted, um, from found ephemera in the world, like colored paper, newsprint, fabric, anything like that. Here we have an example of an early George Brock um, collage. So it would have had mixed media in it, it would have had some drawing in it, maybe some charcoal, maybe some paint. Um, and it, it started initially as a way to break down an image that was representational. So George Brock and Pablo Picasso um, wanted to make cubism in a way that was tangible. And cubism initially was seeing an object or a subject from multiple perspectives. So that's actually in, in true form what cubism really referred to. So analytic uh, cubism was what actually Picasso um, was using. It generally comprised of um, paired fragments in the world um, into a series of basic lines and curves. And then later they changed uh, to moving towards synthetic cubism, which generally just involved fragments, right? So not terribly different. Um, so an example of synthetic cubism would be this early Picasso here, which is very flat, right? Very flat and cut up. Um, so the reason why collage actually exists is because of early artists around the turn of the century like this guy, Marcel Duchamp. And if you move forward in art school, you actually really want to know about why this guy is important. He was a part of the Dada movement, D-A-D-A. -A. Um, and Dada actually doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a kind of gibberish word. And what these Dada artists did is they flipped the script on what constitutes an artwork. And he did it initially with artworks like this. And of course, his famous urinal, right? Men urinate into this. It's flipped upside down and he called it the fountain and he signed it Armut and he did this in 1917. Um, so it was really, and this is before really most people even had electricity. Uh, most people were still riding around on horses. So it was very, very provocative and it really did um, put everything into question as to what constitutes art. And he used what's called the ready-made. So it was found objects from around his, his world, physical objects that were oftentimes mass produced, such as these, the bicycle, you know, the bicycle wheel on top of the chair, etc. And collage actually emerged from, believe it or not, World War I, um, so very early on. And it, it, it happened as a sort of reaction to um, the violence that was being, uh, that really was um, on the face of, of Western Europe uh, that involved almost every single country in the world. So there are different types of collage, um, a good handful of them, in fact. Collage is just a piece of art made by uh, gluing various materials, such as photographs or pieces of paper, 
onto fabric or a backing. Décollage, so all these words are French essentially, décollage is the opposite of collage. It means images are being built up, so usually they're glued together, glued together, glued together, stacked, 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 and then removed away, either carefully or through tearing. Um, and then there's what's called bricolage. It's generally painted junk, right? It's a variety of things sort of smashed onto a surface. Then there's what's known as brulage. It uses burning. And it, it, whenever you see the word ephemera, that refers to paper, typically. Then we have froissage. It's um, a method of collage developed by a Czech artist, Ladislav Novak, in which lines are made by crumpling up a piece of paper in order to create a drawing. So imagine taking a piece of paper, crumpling it up or folding it, and then flattening it out and then tracing all of those lines. Okay, so it's a sort of free form um, abstraction. Then we have frotage. It's the technique of um, taking rubbings from uneven surfaces. A lot of people do this in, um, uh, it's Halloween. Where are people doing this right now? 10 points to Gryffindor if you can tell me. The most popular place to go do a, a frotage or a rubbing during Halloween month, guys. Come on, wakey, wakey. The cemetery, maybe? Wakey, wakey. Then we have montage. Um, it's the process of uh, or technique of selecting, editing, or piecing together separate sections of film in order to form a continuous whole. So this is this is done with just the moving image. And then we have objet trouvé. It's an object found or picked up at random and considered aesthetically pleasing, much like the um, the fountain. Okay. So here we have a, an early example of décollage. This is done in the 50s and 60s by an Italian artist named Mimo Rotea. And so what he would do and he, what he would notice um, is he would notice while walking through the streets of Rome that all of these film posters would be up and the um, film houses would just paste over using wheat paste again and again, just placing the, the new poster right over the next. And so what he would do is he would take these giant stacks, very carefully peel them away from the wall, take them back to his studio, and then he would create new images from them, such as this one. Then we have Brie Collage. We have an American artist here, Robert Rauschenberg, who would use things like taxidermy. Um, here we have a, a stuffed sack that sort of looks like testicles. That is the joke in this image. Um, and then all kinds of material like fabric and paint and tar and oil bars. Then we have another one done by Robert Rauschenberg in the uh, early 60s uh, that utilizes silkscreen over and over and over again. Here we have an example of brulage, the um, technique utilizing smoke. And what you're seeing here is not actually a fire being created, but it, that is indeed a candle that is lit. But the paper is held fairly close to the candle so that the soot collects. Um, so a lot of people do this uh, with... Um, like stencils, they'll, they'll, they'll um, paste, not paste, but they'll lightly adhere a stencil to a piece of paper and then um, burn, or, not burn, but soot around it. Froissage, so this is the crumpled up technique where you trace the lines. And then a montage, all of you are familiar with this word. Um, it uses all kinds of disparate materials. So here you see a bunch of plastics and Legos, et cetera, some playing cards in order to create this sort of face. Then we have traditional collage. Here we have Henri Matisse or Henri Matisse, uh, the French contemporary of Picasso, uh, who they were sort of like enemies, uh, but also friends who were very competitive with each other. And towards the end of his life, he was doing these giant collages because he was pretty much bedridden um, with you know ailments of old age. And he did very beautiful ones. Okay. So that brings us to an issue called archival practices. And if you're going to go into the art world, you need to know this word, archival. Archival means that basically you have an ethical responsibility as an artist to make sure that anything you create and sell lives generations beyond you. Okay, And that means that you're using materials that are not going to simply just decompose in a year. Um, that the understanding, the transaction that takes place between you and your buyer or your collector means that the image will live beyond. So an example of that would be this here, um, which is an artist that I'll later show you, um, who 
does these collages on top of what looks like found newspapers. However, these are actually reprinted newspapers um, printed with archival ink and on paper that will last. Newsprint does not last. So it's actually an archival inkjet print on watercolor paper, which we know will live at least 500 years beyond the artist's lifetime. So that's actually an important thing that you all need to be thinking about as you use materials. That's why I tell you not to use cheap materials if you can avoid it, especially beyond school. But some artists use anti-archival practices as a conceptual means to actually make their work um, stand out. And so Kiefer is one of them. One of the best pieces of art I actually saw was in a collector's house. And it was one of these books that Anselm Kiefer had created of drawings. And these drawings are done uh, in these, and this is a giant book, like six foot wide book. It's huge. But each single page was dipped in what's called slip. And slip is like clay with water. It's dipped in slip, and then the next one is dipped, and then the next one is dipped, and the whole book is closed. And so the collector is charged with turning the page one every year. And when they turn that page, basically that entire page immediately decomposes. So you see the sort of beginnings of that decomposition process here on this book. So the idea is, is that the, um, the owner is actively destroying the artwork by looking at it which is a very interesting sort of meditation on the power of art. Questions about that? No? Okay. Hopefully you're paying attention. Um, what we see here is an image of the very, very first international, international Dada Fair. And what's interesting about it is that it happened in Berlin uh, after World War I. And Berlin, after World War I, was run by the Weimar Republic. And the Weimar Republic was very, very intellectual, very artful. It was a, it was a time when Berlin was really thriving culturally. Um, poets and artists and a very permissive cultural attitude. It was fine to be gay. It was fine to be uh, socialist. It was fine to be um, weird. And... What, what happened was is the Dada movement really did thrive during that era. And it was the nightlife. It was when, um, you know, cabarets were really big. Um, and as you all know, uh, during the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, the, Nazi, um, the Nazis came to power and immediately stamped all of these artists as degenerates. Anything that, wasn't, that didn't look like classical art was considered degenerate, and so it was either destroyed or shut down or mocked. And so what you're looking at is the first image of a Dada art fair, and then we have the beginnings of a Dada um, magazine. This is the cover of a Dada magazine talking about the rise of Nazi fascism and the sort of death of art as a result. So Dada came out of a reaction to the horrors of World War I and Duchamp's investigation of the ready-made, that, that, that um, urinal that we saw earlier. So Dada, as a concept, and I'll read it here, rejected logic, reason, and aestheticism of modernism. Instead of expressing nonsense, originality, and anti-bourgeois protests in their works. The Dadas made no sense. They expressed their discontent with violence, war, and nationalism, or nationalism, and maintain political affinities with the radical left. They were considered radicals because what they did is they made protest art. Okay, it wasn't very clear. It wasn't um, what you would call um, images that were they're highly politically charged in a way that was um, I would do. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Oh, I can't think of the word, but ultimately it wasn't images that were very, very clear to the public. However, you did if you did engage with it, you knew that they were really leaning left and really pushing against the fascist uh, rise. Hannah Hawk, and that's what we're looking at here, two of her collages, um, she was really inspired by the Cubist experiments. Um, and she began, she, along with other artists like Richard Hulzenbeck, John, John Hartford and others, they pioneered a technique called the photo montage. And this is actually really important if any of you are going to go into being uh, graphic designers because they would use pre-existing photographs and they would, they would pull from mass media sources to, comp to create these kind of composite images. So these are actually photographs that are created in a darkroom. 
So everything in Photoshop that you know as a filter or a technique in Photoshop, you pretty much could do in a dark room with traditional photography techniques. And that's what they were doing. And they were also doing these techniques as a means to get the word out about their movement. So here we have two images that are actually on um, Dada newspapers, um, really sort of pushing back against the fascist rise of Nazi um, power. Two more instances of collage. Uh, Kurt Schwitters on the right, he started to make really interesting actual collages with cut paper and found uh, ephemera. Um, and he did one of the coolest things I think in art history when he transformed his entire apartment into essentially a living collage and he did it with paper and wood. Um, and eventually it was destroyed by an air raid, but here we have the, the black and white images are actually images of the original apartment and he totally lived here. Um, and he had people over and it was a sort of considered to be a living artwork. And then on the image on the right is a reconstruction of the now destroyed artwork itself. Here we have some more Hannah Hawks, uh, some collages that are really interesting. And then we move into America and we have one of the very first, if not the first pop art image created by a guy named Richard Hamilton. And yes, that is the title. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? This was a collage that sort of shook the art world because it pulled from modern advertising, which was considered to be low brow. The art world has always prided itself on being something that ultimately stood above um, and what the pop artists did is they utilized collage and appropriation as a means to challenge that. Joseph Cornell was making boxes and he made them in Chicago. Um, there's a whole room devoted to his work at the Art Institute of Chicago, which I grew up looking at, um, of these kind of collage assemblage artworks, which are really beautiful, very strange vignettes. And then we fast forward. And we're moving into American and international art, artists, excuse me, who are using collage today uh, it, it, to, to talk about different things. Lorna Simpson is an African-American artist who pulls from um, publications like Ebony or Black Hair magazines and creates these sort of paintings slash collages as a means to sort of, ex, you know, sort of express um, the varying textures and beauty of black hair. And here we have an installation of some of her collages. Lance Letcher works out of, um, I believe, Austin, Texas. I've seen his work in person, and they're pretty amazing. He uses um, things like signage and very, very thick cardboard, found cardboard, as a means to create these constructions that really do sit off of these panels, probably one or two inches in thickness. They're pretty amazing, and they really do look like sort of these graphic representations of paint. Here are two other images of his. And they oftentimes fit a theme. So you see the box on the left, and then we see this sort of ladders on the right. Arturo Herrera is, I believe, an Argentinian artist. I think he is. And he uses these, um, he will photograph things like paint and then print them out and then cut them up. But he'll also take a lot from Disney, and he will cut them out and create these amazing collages uh, to kind of take them and put them more in an abstract field. I think he's very interesting. He's working today as well. When Gechi Mutu is now an American, I believe she's a, 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 a citizen now, um, she's from Africa. And what she'll do is she'll take th um, things like an airbrush and collage from uh, black exploitation pornography. So images that really do sort of fixate on the black female body in a way that is exploitative. Um, and pair them with high-end fashion magazines that oftentimes are very much just about the white body um, and the elitism of the fashion world. And she'll pair them together in order to create these sort of monstrous images, these sort of Frankenstein images of women. And so if you look very closely at her collages, what you'll see are elements that, you know, might be a buttock, a breast, a, a, you know, a, a wing, um, a fish's mouth in order to recreate 
uh, her notion of the portrait today. It's a sort of modern woman portrait. Eli Craven does very minimal interventions with his collages. Um, they're very clever, and they sometimes might just result in a fold or one single cut as a means to recreate um, or reinvent a found source image. Mark Bradford is one of my favorite um, artists today. He makes huge images. He's an American. And what he'll do is collect things like um, when you get a perm in a hair salon, he grew up in a, he grew up with his mother running a hair salon. They put paper on your hair to protect it from the chemicals. He'll take all those papers. He might take signage found in uh, sort of downtown LA, like who's your daddy DNA tests. I mean, really kind of like grody uh, advertisements. He'll take them, he'll paste them one over the other, over the other, over the other, and he'll use glue in these linear forms, and then he'll sand them down in order to reveal what looks to be like maps. Um, and what that is is actually just the uh, the poured glue d poured in a pattern um, that exposes the paper below. And what they end up look like looking like is like 1950s, 1960s American abstract painting. Which, of course, as a black man, he was excluded from. Um, no major museum really does carry any non-objective abstract imagery from anyone from the 1950s and 60s uh, making abstract images. It was all white men. Um, so he really does, he's really sort of playing with the irony of creating these images from trash that he finds, but really negotiating what that means uh, when you make it on that scale and you would make it in the same aesthetic. Elliot Hundley actually does these sort of assemblage collages. They're intense. Um, they are done painstakingly with things like thread and suspended cut um, collage as well. So some details of his work. So when I say they're crazy, I mean they're absolutely crazy. So this is a very, very large scale image. And there are some details <clears throat> of what you'd see. And these, uh, you see some pins. He might have some reflective surfaces that reflect something that might be pasted on there. I mean, they really are a lot to look at. And they are truly visual experiences that just assault you. <clears throat> Moving back, we have an Eastern European artist by the name of Sergei Sviatchenko, who does these really minimalist, I would say, Dada images on painted um, or uh, printed paper. And there we have him in his studio working. Some of them are very, very large, and some of them are pretty much collage scale. Um, easel scale is what we call that. Daniel Gordon is working today. He's an American. What he does is he takes um, photographs of essentially sculptures that he makes from printed paper. So wrap your head around that. So what you're looking at is a photograph of a setup that he did in his studio of a photograph. So these are photographs that he's cut out to look like flowers. And this vase is a vase that he constructed out of paper. So everything you're looking at here is constructed out of paper. Um, he's got a really interesting Art 21. I would highly recommend that you visit it. And then he'll digitally manipulate some of them um, before he prints them. And here are uh, two other artworks of his. So these are real images that he's photographing of collages and paper sculptures that he's made. Fred Tomaselli, I showed a little bit earlier, he's very interesting. He wants to make his images essentially reflect his experiences on LSD. Um, so they're meant to look like drug-induced uh, psychedelic images. And what he does is he'll, all of these things are collaged. But the difference is, is they're collaged, they're glued to a surface, and then resin is poured over them. And what resin is, is if you're ever at a bar and you see that kind of thick, goopy, plastic-looking um, surface on the bar top, that's resin. So it basically suspends all of these little cut pieces of paper. He'll even use things like pills, tiny little pills, suspended in um, and on these collages. So here we have a detail of something of uh, what he's done. So this is very close up. 
Um, and then we're moving forward into more, uh, e even more newer work. Um, Daniel Samuel Stern is known for doing these um, sort of braided, not braided, I guess you call these weavings of um, photographs that are of the same person, but of different vantage points of the same person. A very simple, uh, yet seemingly very complex looking image. Damien Blatier is a French person who works with um, collages from fashion photography. Sarah Sense does these weavings that very much uh, mock um, weavings that you'd see in native um, blanketry uh, or native um, weaving, you know, like in the bags from found uh, posters. She's probably the closest thing that we're going to touch on today to what you're actually going to do in your assignment. Abigail Reynolds will use uh, multiple images stacked and then she will cut open and fold in order to create these sort of paper sculptures. So these are exposing what's beneath the surface. Cecil Tushan actually paints these, I think they're painted, I'm not sure. They could just simply be ads of um, text. They're cut up text and then reassembled. Injideka Akinili Crosby is one of the most uh, well-known painters sort of rising today. She's one of the most highly collectible. She does these scenes, uh, these interior scenes that, are, that she considers to be paintings of herself with her husband. And she's an African artist who has emigrated to the United States and she's married to a white man. So it's very much about this sort of intimacy, but also the dichotomy of their lived experiences, her as a black woman, him as a white man. Um, but they're very uh, lovely and very tender images. But she uses collage uh, through her use of um, transfers. And essentially they're Xerox transfers that she applies directly to paper um, and then paints on top of in order to create these visual narratives. Ernesto Artillo, another artist who uses collage from high-end fashion photography. Maurizio Anzeri uses, um, uh, uses sewing and embroidery. Embroidery is very hot right now as a means to sort of recreate or transform an image. And then we have a collage uh, sort of sculpture here of the same face, uh, of the same artist, so it's a it's an um, it's a self portrait. So that brings us to the question of collage as a means to creating street art. Um, so a lot of street artists right now are actually doing zero like large Xerox prints, and what they're doing is they're pasting it using wheat paste, which has traditionally been used as a means to just simply hang flyers or photographs, because eventually that image will actually decay and it will no longer exist. So the ethics of that are um, still up for debate because it's usually on private property. I don't really have a feeling about it, but um, it certainly is not spray painting on top of someone's private property, thus transforming it permanently. So here we have a little bit, a little bit more in street art. Ignore that. Okay. So uh, what we're doing, so pay special attention here, is we're doing a reappropriated poster assignment. So your assignment will be using two to four highly colored found or purchased posters, so you can find them or you can purchase them, create a brand new, sorry, that's meant to say brand new, not brand next, brand new two-dimensional art object. Your objective is to combine through any means disparate images in order to transform the compositions and original design fully. The new color assignment must be visually appealing and coalesce into an aesthetically pleasing palette. So you may tear, collage, weave, reassemble, and alter in any way you choose, any way that we talked about today, with the exception of one of these rules. So your rules are, you must not add any other media beyond your found poster. You may alter them in any way, but you may not add paint or any other media to transform them, only to affix or expose or tear or etc. But any media that you use must be either glue, paste, or clear acrylic. Those are fine. Two, your final image must measure at least 16 by 20 or larger. It doesn't have to be perfectly uh, rectangular. Um, it can be a completely organic shape like what I showed you today. It's up to you. Um, you three, you must alter your found posters by at least 50 to 
ranging from slightly familiar to completely unrecognizable in source. So our objective is to completely transform it. I don't want to see a giant face that you um, felt uncomfortable cutting up, okay? I don't want to know where you got that poster from. I don't want to know that it's Justin Bieber, right? Four, your new color combination must coalesce into a pleasing palette. So choose posters that are very different in color. Um, maybe bright, maybe incredibly disparate. Maybe one's really dull and dark and one's really bright and neon. And then five, your final image must be one single image presented cleanly and carefully crafted. So I'm gonna stop.